From the Youth Science Council, this is Good Question, a podcast about science in the UAE. I'm your host, Sada Shirbeji. Today, we are joined by Dr. Laura Menenti. Dr. Menenti is a postdoctoral researcher in particle physics at New York University, Abu Dhabi. In this episode, we spend all of our time talking about dark matter. So here is our discussion. Welcome to the show, Dr. Laura. Hello. Thank you. Can you give us a quick glimpse into your life and what you do? So I'm a particle physicist. I work, uh, my field of expertise is dark matter and neutrino physics. I'm an experimental physicist and I work uh, on two big experiments. Uh, one is called uh, uh, Xenon and Tan and the other one is called uh, Protodune. And one is a dark matter experiment, and one is a, the second one is a neutrino experiment. And we also have another bunch of small experiments, which we do in our lab here at NYUAD. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this dark matter. Uh, dark matter exists outside the framework of the standard model of particle physics. Let's take this one step at a time. What is the standard model? So basically, the standard model is... Uh, the picture that we have, so it's the name of the picture that we have of a particle, uh, elementary particles. So one step back. So what are elementary particles? So basically, if you take like everything, uh, it's like, uh, I don't know, a glass of water, our skin, the sun, the chair where we're seated on, everything, and you divide it into tiny, tiny pieces, and you keep on dividing that thing into tiny pieces, at some point you cannot divide it anymore. Mm. So everyone knows about the atom. So the atom is not an elementary particle. The atom, for example, gold is made of uh, gold atoms. And these are tiny bricks. Uh, each of these tiny bricks is made of a nucleus and electrons. And usually you have the picture of the electrons uh, orbiting around the nucleus. And the nucleus, uh, maybe people know that it's made of protons and neutrons. And while electrons are elementary particles, so you cannot split them up again, uh, they're indivisible, protons and neutrons can be split uh, further into quarks uh, and gluons. So gluons, uh, physicists like uh, these funny names. So, so gluons are named gluons because they glue quarks together in protons and neutrons. And elementary particles are not actually that many. So right now I talked about electrons, we talked about quarks, we talk, talked about uh, gluons, and then next to the electron we have the muon and the tau. Right now you and me are traversed by roughly one or two muons a second. These are particles like the electron, in a way, so elementary particles. I usually say that the muon is the chubby brother of the electron. So it's very similar to the electron in terms of charge, but it's much, much heavier. And then you have the tau, which is another elementary particle, which is even heavier than the muon. And then each of these particles has a neutrino associated with them. and neutrinos comes come in three flavors so the electron neutrino the mu neutrino and the tau neutrino and basically we're almost done so we talked about gluons gluons make particles communicate with each other so if i'm communicating with you through my voice and through the air okay so my voice is getting to to you through the air how do two electrons communicate with each other? They do it uh, with a particle which you probably know, which is the photon. So light is made of photons. And quarks communicate with each, with each other through gluons. And neutrinos communicate with each other through another particle, which is called the, the Z boson. Uh, and... W boson. And that's basically it. So we <laughs> named all the particles. So electron mu, tau, the quarks, the gluon, W, Z boson, 
the photon uh, and the Higgs boson is the particle that gives mass uh, to all the particles. And that's it. So it, it's pretty impressive to think that everything in the universe uh, is just uh, made of these tiny little things. So elementary particles are particles that can no longer be subdivided into any other particles. Yes, exactly. And you and right now you're traversed by neutrinos uh, and muons. Uh, and going back to your questions about dark matter, we also believe that you are also traversed uh, by dark matter. Your body is traversed by uh, dark matter. What's dark matter? So, so dark matter, we think it's a particle, but it's a particle we have never uh, observed, uh, discovered. And uh, so how do we know dark matter exists? So, so <laughs> imagine you I are... I get to ask the questions yeah. here. <laughs> So imagine you are in a dark room and you walk in and you stump into something and you go, ouch. So you say, well, there must be something in the room because that was painful. Okay. Right? And, but then people tell you, well, you didn't see it. Yeah, but I did feel it. So it yeah. must be there. Yeah. But the room is dark and you, there is no way for you to see it. So then you create a device which can see in the dark. And finally, you see that there was uh, a chair in the middle of the room. And that's, that, that was the thing you, you stepped up on. And that's basically the same with dark matter. So, so in the analogy, the chair is dark matter. Yes. Except that we haven't found it. Or at least our techniques haven't found it. Yeah, exactly. So we have not, we haven't managed to build a device uh, which is able to see that thing in this dark room. Okay. So, so we know it's there because we see gravitational effects. Uh. So one example is you see a distant object, uh, a luminous object, uh, and Einstein told us that uh, if there is a, a heavy object. Uh, in space, uh, space gets bended. And so light will follow the bending of, of space. So if I see, if I have an, a distant object, a luminous distant object, and I'm looking at it, but the light that I see is distorted, uh, then I say, well, there must be something in between me and the object uh, which is distorting space. Uh, and that's why I see the distortion. So at that point, I would say, well, based on the distortion that I see, this must be the mass of the object in between me and that distant object I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. This is one example. So there are other examples, and we call, the, uh, we call these, these things that indirect evidences of dark matter. So in the analogy would be you walk into the room and there's something that causes pain, and that's the indirect evidence uh, for you to say there must be something in the middle of the room, basically. Yeah. So it's inferences you make from current evidence in order to... So you're positing an explanation. And given dark matter, a lot of things seem to make sense. Exactly. Yeah. And dark matter... Right now, we think that uh, uh, dark matter makes 85% uh, of the matter content in the universe. So basically... The entire universe is pretty much dark to our eyes. Yeah. And, in, and, and the reason it's called dark, uh, it's just because we don't see it. It's not. Yeah. It, yeah. I love these functional names that <laughs> physicists give to things. Gluons and dark matter. <laughs> uh, so uh, wh um, what are some of the techniques in physics and, and um, astronomy that are used to find dark matter? And which of them have been more successful than others? Now, I'm curious about this question, if it makes sense, which of them have been more successful than others, given that we do not have success in tracing um, dark matter. So maybe success would be defined in a different way. Uh, how would you define success when you're comparing techniques and you're comparing different instruments that aim at tracing or finding dark matter? So there are three techniques to find dark matter, which can be, so these are, you either break it, shake it, uh, or make it. <laughs> so, so you make it at the LHC, for example. So the LHC is the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which is a, a 27 kilometers ring between Switzerland and France uh, under the Earth. And there are protons, uh, so we talked about protons. Uh, the protons uh, um, rotate in these rings, and then at some point they clash against each other, and they produce stuff, uh, and they can produce dark matter. And basically, 
this is a very basic explanation, and I'm sorry for no, thanks. that we study these, <laughs> these things the way they, they do it. Yeah. Uh, but basically, you kind of uh, count everything that came up from that clash. Right. And if there is something missing, you say that's dark water. Okay. Kind of. That's okay. a very, very bad explanation. But it's okay. I'll rudimental. Um, right. So you make it... Um, you uh, break it uh, so uh, it can um, see, so you basically see product sub products uh, of dark matter okay so you you're not looking at dark matter directly but it's constituents uh, no it's like um, so two dark matter particles uh, uh, annihilate uh, and they produce something okay and you look at that something right. okay. okay and these are experiments uh, like Pamela and others, uh, and usually these are, like, in space. Yeah. And then you have experiments like, for example, Xenon, uh, the, which is the experiment which I work on. So this is uh, the shake it one. So you have a target. Uh, in this case, the target is uh, a Xenon atom. And you believe that dark matter is a particle, and this particle scatters off the xenon atom, which shakes, mm. recoils, and when it recoils, it produces a signal, which you then see. And this is called direct detection, uh, because you're basically directly observing dark matter by observing the recoil it has produced. Mm-hmm. And right now, uh, so the two main techniques uh, for direct detection, there are several. Um, probably I would say the main one, actually not two, but the main one uses uh, liquid xenon. So xenon is a noble gas, a very heavy one. It's in air uh, at the sub percent level. You liquefy air and at some point you get xenon so it's very much like, like in terms of like how does it look like it looks like uh, nitrogen liquid nitrogen um which you can make ice cream uh with and <laughs> which i did once um and but it's much uh warmer so liquid nitrogen is a uh, uh, minus 198 uh celsius uh, and xenon is minus uh, 100 degrees uh, so you fill a tank uh, with xenon, and then you instrument that tank uh, with uh, sensors that see light. So these are your eyes, basically. And then you wait for your particles uh, to get into your detector. They would shake the xenon atoms. Uh, and xenon has this property that when a particle scatter off, uh, scatters off a xenon atom, Light and charge, uh, so char uh, charge in terms of electrons, uh, are produced. You look at the light, so you record the light, uh, you record the charge, uh, and you can reconstruct uh, where the event happened within your tank uh, and how much energy was deposited. And basically these two things uh, will tell you, was it dark matter or was it something else? So the majority are, of our events are not dark matter, uh, are what we call background events, which is, be, which is kind of junk, like it's all the garbage you have to throw away. Right. Are these any experiments that you personally work on or you're citing other experiments that you don't? So uh, this one is the, so, uh, so uh, the experiment that I work on is called Xenon. Uh, so it, it has, it, it had various stages. Uh, it started with xenon 10, xenon 100, xenon 1 ton, and now we are upgrading uh, the detector, uh, which was called xenon 1 ton, to xenon n ton. Why n ton? Because we didn't know how much tons of xenon, uh, xenon we were going to use. Uh, now we know it's uh, 8.4 tons. Xenon is very expensive, uh, so like one kilo of xenon is more than $3,000, uh, so you're talking about millions uh, just to buy the xenon. Where do you buy from? You buy, so it's, uh, 
it's the same companies that, that uh, would uh, give you the xenon to make the BMW xenon bulbs. Uh, okay. <laughs> basically the same. Uh, the amount of xenon we'll have in our detector, I think, will be approximately 30% of these liquid xenon produced uh, in a year worldwide. Uh yeah. Wow. And the reason we use so, and then there are other experiments. So, so, so this type of detector, just for the record, it's called uh, liquid. So this is a, it's called dual phase liquid. Well, actually, let's say liquid xenon time projection chamber. Uh, liquid because we use xenon not in its gaseous form but liquid form. Uh, chamber because it's like it's a chamber. Uh, Time projection because, uh, okay, this is kind of a subtle thing. So you have, so y your particle gets in, interacts with your xenon, and, and emits light. And that's your T0 of the event. It tells you when it happened. And you record mm. the light. Mm. So this is your time. Mm. Projection because then the, the electrons which are produced right there, they get drifted upwards because we apply an electric field. It drift upwards, uh, and at that point you have a 2D image of the event, and that's why projection. So time projection chamber. That's uh, there are also other experiments which instead of xenon use argon, which is uh, cheaper, but it has other disadvantages. Right now, the most sensitive detector in the world, uh, well, used to be because it's not operating anymore, xenon one ton which is this detector in Andre Mountain in Italy, and which is the experiment that NYUAD uh, works on. And why Andre Mountain? Because, uh, as I said before, we're traversed by many other particles, uh, especially muons, uh, and you don't want to see muons. Uh, and if you place your detector under something like concrete uh, or just the earth, uh, then you get some natural shielding. And that's why usually these types of, of detectors are under mines uh, or under mountains. Uh. So our direct competitor is in the US, uh, in South Dakota. It's, they're also upgrading it. It's called LZ, and it's in a mine. So. Mm, right. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this earlier, but you're a researcher in NYU Abu Dhabi. And so this stuff, so you said you're doing it in the mountain, but also you do, you have a lab here, you work, you do your research in the lab. So this xenon, these experiments, they occur in the lab. So, so the, so we, so there are a bunch of things you can do remotely, uh, which is mainly data analysis. Uh, for okay. all the rest, uh, we actually go there. It has so, to be done in the lab. Yes. So we go. So do you house... 30% of in, in that lab. In, in, in Gran Sasso, on this mountain. On yes, this mountain. yes, All it's right. there. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. So the, it's an international lab, actually, yeah. which hosts uh, several experiments. Yeah. And uh, there are three holes, uh, and uh, one of them hosts uh, our experiment uh, along with other experiments yeah, as well. Yeah, I see. And so when we are working on the hardware, we have to be there, which mm. is usually during the summer because no one wants to be there during the summer, but mm. we very much like not to be here during yeah. the summer and be in, in uh, yeah, on the mountains in yeah. the summer. And then here instead, so right now we're working on an experiment uh, also on dark matter, uh, which is called, um, it's, it's an optical haloscope for dark matter. It's a totally different thing in the sense that, oh, I didn't mention this before. So uh, dark matter, we, we, we said that we think dark matter is a particle. Mm. And the type of particle that the xenon experiment is looking for is called WIMP, which means weakly interactive, interacting massive particle weakly because inter it interacts via the weak force, uh, which is one of the four forces uh, with gravity, electromagnetism, and uh, the strong force. 
uh, massive because it has to carry a mass, uh, interacting because it has to interact uh, in particle because it's an elementary particle. But then there are also other models in physics which uh, uh, say, which basically say that there could be other possible particles. And so, for example, here in, in NYU Abu Dhabi, we are making an experiment which is devised to see another type of particle, another type of dark matter particle. Mm. It, but it's, it's ex exclusive. So if, if WIMPs exist, then the one we would look here in, in NYU Abu Dhabi would not exist. Mm. Uh, Right now, the situation is that uh, uh, we haven't found it yet. And experiments take a long time to be built and to get funded. So usually you want to be ahead of time, always. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what about dark matter? How's the progress going with that? So in general, I would say the front line is probably xenon and the LZ experiment in yeah. the US. Yeah. Uh, so right now we have not found dark matter. <laughs> right. Um, so the, the problem of this experiment is that at some point, uh, which is very soon, like with the next upgrade, uh, we will start seeing uh, neutrinos coming from the sun um, and um, and that's an, an, an unavoidable background. Uh, what does it mean? In, so so there, there are neutrinos which are produced in the sun and they come in billions uh, every second, well, even more than billions, every second, every, like, per centimeter square. And they would get into our detector and at that point they would give you a signal which is the same as a dark matter signal. So you cannot distinguish them. Oh no, right. So then you say, crap, so how do you distinguish them? Well, one way is to, if you see a modulation because uh, the earth rotates, uh, spins on itself. Uh, so obviously the flux, that I know. Uh, yeah, so the, obviously the flux of it's neutrinos. the only thing I know uh, <laughs> in this uh, conversation. <laughs> the, the flux of neutrinos uh, varies uh, over day and night. Uh, you, you have more neutrinos during the day than you have during the night. So then you mm. could say, well, do, do I see... A, a, so that's one thing. And this is getting complicated. Um, and you, ha you would have to see, like, something on top of that, uh, right. which would be dark matter. Okay. And dark matter also has a modulation... Why? Because... Wait, what do you mean modulation? Okay, modulation means this. Okay. So modulation means a variation in time. Okay. Okay. Let me go back one step because I think I messed up things a bit. So, okay. So, so I said that one problem is that you have these neutrinos, uh, which would give you a signal which is very similar to sure. the dark matter. I one. get that And part. that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. So then you say, how do I distinguish my neutrinos, my um, dark matter from the neutrinos? Yeah. So, Dark matter has a modulation. Modulation means that, that it's not constant over time. It means uh, I'm giving oh, you a candy right. every second. No, I'm giving you a can more candies uh, uh, during June and less candies during December. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that's so, the thing. And why do you get more dark matter in June than in December? Yeah. Because the Earth... Uh, rotates uh, around the sun and the sun rotates uh, around the Milky Way and it takes about 300 million years uh, to rotate uh, around the Milky Way. Mm. Now imagine that the Milky Way is immersed uh, into a halo of dark matter which is uh, static so it's not moving mm. but you are moving so it's uh, it seems that there, there is a wind uh, of dark matter coming against you but then but, and the sun is always I mean on the time scale we are going to be living uh, uh, which is less than 300 million years uh, yeah unfortunately the, the, the sun will always uh, go in the same direction and the direction is the direction of the Cygnus uh, of the constellation Cygnus mm. it's always going that way okay right. but then the earth is not because uh, the earth goes around the sun right so at some point it's going 
the same way as the sun. And then at some point, it will go the opposite direction. Yes. So basically, your wind of dark matter is going to be larger at one time of the year and smaller at another time of the year. Yeah. So if you manage to see that, then you can say, uh, yeah, that, that can be a signature of dark matter. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the fact that we're going to see neutrinos is going to be kind of a problem. Right. So I have a question about this because I thought that neutrinos were a candidate for dark matter. So here I'm seeing there's a competition between yeah. them. So they're <laughs> not. Explain that. They're not. They cannot make, yeah, they cannot account for the dark matter in the universe. Uh, and the reason is cosmological. Why? So I said that there are some indirect evidences for the existence of, of dark matter and I quoted the gravitational one. So the, the one that I talked about before is called gravitational lensing. Mm. So then, so we see the universe in, in a certain way nowadays. You can make models, simulations on your computer uh, where you put a percentage of matter, a percentage of dark matter, and you see how the universe uh, would evolve. Now, if uh, you don't have dark matter at all, then you cannot explain uh, the structure of the, the, the universe has uh, today. You, you cannot explain it. Uh, you would have a different universe, uh, which would be much more homogeneous. Okay. Um, why do you need dark matter? And you, you actually need one... Uh, homogeneous in the sense that you would have the same of a lot. It would be like, yeah, you would... You would You'd have the variety so that we have today. Like galaxies are the thing that make the universe non-homogeneous. Okay. So when you have like spots of yeah. mass here yeah. and there, yeah. that makes it not, not uh, homogeneous. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the, the dark matter that we're looking for... It's called cold dark matter. Cold in physics terms uh, means non-relativistic. Non-relativistic means uh, it doesn't go at the speed of light. Okay. Non-relativistic means, means that it, it doesn't, doesn't go, go fast. at the speed of light. Okay. Why is it called non-relativistic? Well, what's the hot, name? Because when you have like so when you have hot particles, uh, yeah. they're moving really fast okay, everywhere. Right, okay, right. They have a lot of kinetic energy, yeah. and so they're so moving So this everywhere. means that they're moving at the speed of light? So neutrinos do move at the speed of light. Okay, so they're hot. They're hot. Okay. They're not cold. They're, okay, they're hot. Now, what's the problem with, like, neutrinos being hot, which that is being relativistic, which is moving at the speed of light? So, so we believe... Uh, Wait, I sorry, I'm so, I'm really curious about that. Yeah. Why is relativistic speed of light like what's the name? Why what does that mean? Ooh, relativistic. Uh, uh well, relativistic I think it's actually well, uh, okay, the etymology I think it refers to relativity. Yeah. Uh and I think it's like relative. Yeah. I would say, but this is just my educated guess. So okay. I don't know. <laughs> but I, so so in the special relativity, uh mm. one uh, there are two postulates, basically. Uh, one is that the speed of light uh, is constant uh, and that there are no... Basically, any framework of reference is equivalent to another. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the speed of light is constant kind of means it's not relative. Okay. Uh, then I don't know if it's actually... I mean, All I right, I get it. I don't yeah. know if that's... Yeah, okay, uh, that's I guess it's... Uh, yeah, yeah uh, it's interesting. And... Um, Yes, yeah, so basically, if you go back in time, you had two opposite forces. Yeah. You had matter, mm -hmm. which wants to stick together. Mm. And then you have radiation, which repels. Right. What's radiation? Radiation means light. Okay. Basically. But any type of light. So even like, uh, even the light you don't see, like yeah. infrared, whatever. Yeah. So let's say you have matter and this matter keeps on collapsing what happens it becomes really 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 hot and at some point uh, it will explode okay right and then it explodes but then uh, then you have 
the matter which still wants to keep to 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 be together yes. and so it collapses yeah. and then it explodes and it's collapsing and but then what happens um, if you put a pinch of dark matter of cold dark matter okay so dark matter that doesn't move a lot at that and dark matter we know that dark matter does not uh, interact uh, gravity uh, in electromagnetically okay so it means that Matter is collapsing, dark matter is collapsing. At some point, the radiation, because it becomes everything becomes really hot. Yeah. Radiation pushes everything apart. Yeah. But not dark matter. Because dark matter is invisible to radiation. Mm. It just do- doesn't see it. So dark matter keeps on collapsing. Mm. So at, at that point, you can have structures, uh, like gravitational structures, mass structures in the universe. Uh, and that is your seed uh, for the formation of stars and eventually galaxies, uh, basically. Mm. So, so that is, so from a cosmological point of view, you, we could not have the universe uh, as we see today without dark matter. And this is actually a very compelling evidence because there have, there are several theories which try to explain things without dark matter, but probably cosmology. I'm not a cosmologist, but I would say the cosmology is like cosmological evidences are probably one of the th- things uh, that dark matter can explain well, wh- whereas other theories uh, cannot explain. So you have the gravity, which is separate from the cosmology explanation. Yes. They're two separate things. It explains two separate yes. things. Yes. So yes. it looks like it explains a variety of things. So if we, it's like, so if we find dark matter, a lot of things get explained. It's like as if, uh, going back to the example of the dark room, uh, you have a sense which is your touch. Uh, so you could feel there was something. Right. And then maybe that chair or whatever was the object in the room also has a smell and you can also smell it. Mm. So one... The smell could be the cosmological evidence uh, and yeah. the touch could be your yeah. gravitational yeah. evidence, basically. How big are physicists really on the explanation of dark matter? Do you have some people who are just not, you know, accepting it, just not into it? So there, so actually, so, so there is a debate. Um, uh, so, so, so the first... Uh, um, theory that everyone studies it at universities uh, called the modified Newtonian dynamics. Yes. So basically what you say is, uh, well, uh, you say that there is dark matter because you think that uh, gravity behaves uh, the way you think it behaves, mm-hmm. according to Newton. But what if uh, we modify gravity, okay, then we can account for that missing matter. We just don't need it. It's just that you're trying to explain something with the wrong set of rules. Yeah. But then modified Newton dynamics cannot explain all the things that we see. Right. So then there are other theories which are called modified gravity. Basically, the underpinning point is that you modified Einstein general relativity. The pr- kind of problem with that is that general relativity works really, really well. Um, and, for example, we have just uh, observed uh, gravitational waves. So it, it works well. Uh, so nobody I mean, wants that was to a modify prediction. it. Yeah. That was a prediction, and, and we did observe that. So, like, to modify something which is working so well. Yeah. There are also other theories. Uh, yeah. Um, which do not require modifying gravity, uh, but I'm not an expert on that. Uh, yeah. But so far, I would say that uh, probably the majority of, I mean, I would so say saying that the majority of the scientific community would say that yes, dark, dark matter. matter. Okay. So you, basically the response is, if you modify gravity, then dark matter explanation is no longer required. required. Yes. That's interesting. All of that is really interesting. I, I don't know if you know, I'm just going to ask anyway, but 
Do we have examples in history of physics that are parallel to dark matter as an explanation where people are positing an explanation that if correct, everything adds up really well. The explanations become really good and then they eventually find it many years later. So um, something that would be uh, part of the history of physics that required <laughs> that kind of leap of faith that a lot of people tend to have when it comes to dark, dark matter. So at the beginning of last century, yeah, um, something was observed uh, which was clashing with uh, a law which was conservation of energy. Mm. And, and so it was either conservation of energy was not a law and it was being violated, or the existence of a new particle had to be postulated. Are you talking about the Higgs boson? No, this no. is the neutrino, okay. actually. Neutrino, okay. <laughs> so, and I think at that time, okay, it's not... It doesn't have to be the mantra for physics, uh, but it works pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I I think at the time was really that cons conservation of energy is something so beautiful that it has to be true. Yeah. And that's your leap of faith uh, if yeah. you want. Uh, and in a way, um, with uh, modified gravity, it's kind of the same thing. Okay. Uh, like... Gr uh, Einstein's theory, as it is, uh, is so elegant and beautiful that you don't want to touch it. Yeah. Then I'm not saying that, I mean, if you do see something that clashes with that, uh, then yeah. obviously as a physicist you would say, okay, the theory is wrong. Yeah. I just have to modify it. I yeah. have to, um, you have to be truthful to your, to reality. So... Conservation of energy was modified in no, order? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, at the time, uh, the, the, so the new particle was then found, what, 20 years later? Okay. But at the time, people They thought said there was a conflict. There was a conflict, and people said there must be a new particle, which we're not seeing. Okay, I so see. So instead of saying energy uh, is not conservated, yeah. they said there must be a new particle. I see. <laughs> because right. it was such, like such a strong, beautiful law that, like, giving that up uh, would yeah. have been a thing. Yeah. And here it's kind of the same thing. Uh, probably a bit more difficult because we're be we've been hunting for dark matter for quite a while now. Um, uh, but I would say that, in general, I think beauty is a guiding principle in things. Uh, it doesn't have to be the guiding principle in the sense that I mean, if you don't see it, you don't see it, right? If you right. don't see dark matter, then you have to start looking somewhere else. Yeah, um, I understand. Okay, so conservation of energy did, did need to have been modified in order to yes, uh, explain that. Yes. Similarly, then uh, Einstein does need to be modified in order to posit dark yeah. matter. Yeah, we'll see, I guess. T only time will tell, huh? So that would make dark matter a theory or hypothesis? Because my understanding is that it would be a hypothesis prior to being a theory? Because, for example, I know that's theory of general relativity. Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Is it quite it's at that probably, level? Is it quite I at that level? I think it's at the level of a yeah. theory. Yeah, I would say it's uh, at the level of a theory, yeah. which has to be proved. Yeah. Is it is it beautiful? I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to see it, uh, like, in my lifespan. That's the... That's, I yeah. wonder how much that biases us uh, to kind of be looking for an elegant theory, elegance in the universe, beauty in the universe. Perhaps that's probably misguiding and it may not be so elegant and beautiful. I mean, it, I mean, I would say that okay, that's, that's got a guided principle, that's for sure. Yeah. But it's not on the only one. Yeah. Like right now... Einstein's re uh, general relativity explains everything we've seen, like everything. There's nothing it cannot explain. Yeah. So and when a theory can make such predictions, uh, you just say it must be true. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that's, and then, and then there is another thing about, besides beauty, like you would have to make things so more complicated uh, to account for dark matter in another way. That, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, I see, yeah. 
Uh, I think similarly, perhaps, also in the history of physics, that when scientists posited the Earth as the center of the solar system, that also made things very complicated. Exactly. And when the sun was later accommodated as the uh, center of the solar system, it made things a lot more elegant. Exactly. All right. So my um, my next question for you is, of course, you're a female scientist. And uh, and you, you work to address the underrepresentation of women in STEM. Um, and what can you tell us about specific challenges you encountered? And uh, how, how did you feel, how, how did you deal with these challenges? Do you, do you have any specific advice for women uh, who would uh, like to go into scientific career? So my challenges are mainly as a mother, I would say. Yeah. Um, so, and, and why, why is that? Uh, because uh, in academia, you are required to travel a lot, to conferences, uh, and not only. You, it seems uh, um, required from you to do your PhD in a place, uh, your postdoc in another place, uh, maybe another postdoc, and eventually a tenure track somewhere else. And this is very hard when you have a family. Then what, you know, what specific advice would you have for then women going into STEM? Do, would, should, they be, should we be discouraged? Or should no, we, think, you know... Uh, I think in so probably the thing that I would say is that not to give up on being a woman, just be a woman. <laughs> so I too often see uh, colleagues uh, acting like men, uh, and I I think it's like it's good and it's great to be to to bring your diversity, which is like you being a female. Among, yes, I mean, majority of my colleagues are male. Bringing that diversity to your workplace, it's, it's a good thing. You don't have to be like everyone else. Uh, so just, just, and for example, if you want to have a kid, just have a kid. Uh, you should not be pressured not to have a kid because it's expected from you that uh, you have to publish X amount of papers in a year because uh, then you're not yourself anymore. So for people who are interested in learning more about what you do, uh, where should they be looking? Ooh, on my Twitter page. <laughs> uh, we also have a website um, coming soon uh, at NYUD with right. uh, like the stuff that we do. I, I usually communicate... Um, I do outreach uh, through my Twitter page. Uh, that's usually where I talk about my, my research, uh, what we do here at NYU Abu Dhabi. I find it convenient. Yeah. Awesome. So thanks for this conversation. It was really interesting. Um, a lot of information, a lot of stuff that's new to me. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank you for your time. Thanks. That was Dr. Laura Menenti, postdoctoral researcher in particle physics at New York University, Abu Dhabi. This episode was sponsored by Mutant Academy. To listen to more episodes, you can find Good Question on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for what you'd like to see from us next, you can reach us at goodquestionuae on Instagram and Twitter, or email us at info at goodquestion.ae. Good Question is a production of the Youth Science Council and the Office of Advanced Sciences in the United Arab Emirates, produced and directed by Hind Al-Ali and Hayat Al-Hassan. Sound designed by Jean-Michel Elias. Sara Al-Ali is our editor. Our social media and communications are managed by Mohammed Al-Mansouri and Fatma Luta. And I'm Sara Shirbaji.